So, today we're going to be talking about writing materials and specifically paper. All right, so the first thing we always do in each one of these lectures is to ask ourselves what are the properties of the material we're studying this week, All right? And so in this case, paper, right, is actually a composite, okay? So it means it's made of fibers that are stuck together. Um, it is pretty tough material. Paper, you, you, you're familiar with paper, it's fairly tough, it's opaque, it's thin, right? It's cheap, it's flexible, and it can be colored, right? And, uh, and it can be recycled and it degrades with time. So um, the real advantage to paper is it stores information for long periods of time. So let's talk about information storage. So what, is the, what are the materials behind the written word? So if we go back in history and we ask ourselves how we communicated through time, if you go all the way back to the Sumerians, then what you find out is they use clay tablets. And clay tablets are a great way to communicate and store information. And actually, it's a very permanent way of storing information. We can still read those clay tablets today. However, of course, it's limited because it's very heavy. Um, the Egyptians decided to do something thinner, so they took a papyrus, which is a plant, and took the reeds out of the papyrus, and they found that if they beat them and soak them and then layered them down and pressed them together that the sugars in the papyrus would actually allow those pieces of papyrus to stick together and form a paper-like substance. And, uh, and so they used that for writing for a long time. In Turkey, around 400 BC, they, they were using um, wax tablets. They were also using papyrus. Uh, wax was put onto a piece of wood and then written on and it could be erased by simply uh, heating up the wax or wiping over the wax. Curiously enough, it was around 200 BC that the Chinese actually invented paper. They were the first to invent paper. Um, and it didn't reach the Western world to uh, many, many, many years later. Uh, the Romans were famous for using the parchment as well. Um, and they would store a lot of information. Now, the way the Romans did it is that they actually stored information in the form of a roll. All right. And then they evolved from a roll to a codex. And so we're going to talk more about that in a minute. All right, so paper making didn't actually translate itself over into Western Europe until somewhere around 700 AD, it got into Iraq, and then it started to drift north. Uh, and by 1400 or 1300, there was a lot of paper making going on. And by the 1800s, we actually transitioned from making paper from things like cotton to making paper from wood. So that's sort of a brief history of, of paper. Now. If you want to understand how to do papyrus, there are a lot of really great videos out there that can show you how you can turn papyrus reeds into a writing material. And so I encourage you to watch one of those videos. Now, as I said, the Romans invented the concept of a codex, all right? So early, written, early writing was often done in a roll form, right? And if you roll up a piece of, of writing material, then you could store a lot of information on it. However, it was very difficult to access the information in the middle of it. You would have to constantly unroll it to find that one particular page. So what the Romans did is they developed what they call a codex. And in that sense, what they did was they would put information on a sheet and then they would fold it over and then they would put more information on the sheet, they would fold it over and then they bound those sheets together into what basically was amounted to what we think of today as a book. Now, they started to run out of papyrus because there was a huge demand on papyrus. And so with the resources diminishing and also the inherent instability of papyrus, they decided to switch to another material and they started using parchment. Now parchment is basically animal skin that has been uh, cleaned and dried and can be written on. Obviously that's expensive. And so that was a challenge, but that was the only thing they had available. And so they started making codexes the Bible, for example, was one of the earliest forms of a codex. And in effect, right, when you write a book, it's, it's sort of an earliest form of random access memory. Because if you think about it, what it means is that I can go anywhere into the book and I can actually pick a page number and I can open it up and then I can read the information on that particular page, right? And so I don't have to scroll through the whole thing to get to that page. And that was actually a really revolutionary idea. All right. so. If we look at paper in more detail, right? So we had parchment and then we evolved to paper. Now, as I said, the paper was invented by the Chinese around 200 BC, and then it spread to Iraq around 700 AD. And so the advantage to paper was is that it's obviously much, much less expensive. And so the paper mill started up. And then when they started up, they started using paper that was made from flax and from cotton, right? So those materials are very easy to make into paper because they're ostensibly cellulose, which is the prime ingredient for paper, all right? And in fact, 
when uh, Gutenberg in 1458 actually got around to printing uh, items like the Bible, he actually started off with parchment and, uh, and eventually it moved into paper. So, so let's take a closer look at what paper is, all right? Paper is made from cellulose. So cellulose is a part of a plant, all right? And basically cellulose is the first polymer we're gonna talk about in this class, all right? So cellulose is a very long chain molecule and when you stitch it together, um, it can have interesting properties because the chains are so long they actually entangle and it gives it strength, all right? So if I take something like cotton, cotton is 95% cellulose. So it was very relatively easy to make paper from cotton because it was so, it's so ostensibly all cellulose. However, it's very expensive. So in the 1840s, they started to say, well, why can't we find another form of cellulose, another way of making paper? And so the first idea was to try to use wood. Now, if you're gonna use wood, what you have to do is create a pulp. The pulp from a wood is actually the cellulose, all right? So they developed multiple methods, a mechanical way of, of pulping the material, and in the 1840s, and then by the 1867 or so, they developed a sulfurous acid way of chemically pulping the material. And by the 1880s, they had the craft process, which is a sulfate process for pulping the materials. And the craft process has become the dominant way of making paper. So let's take a look at wood, right? We're gonna make a piece of paper out of wood. How do we start with this thing? As I said, wood is a natural composite. It's actually a composite that is about 40% cellulose, it's about 20 or 30% hemicellulose, which is sort of uh, disorganized random chains that are smaller of the cellulose. And then more importantly, it's about 25 to 30% lignin, all right? So lignin um, is the contaminant in wood that you have to try to get rid of or deal with, all right? Cellulose is a natural polymer. It's a very long chain of sugars connected together. And the chain can be 10,000 sugar units long. Um, it's very organized and it tends to be very hydrophilic, so it loves water. Now, the lignin in the wood is actually another chemical that bonds these cellulose chains together, and that's what gives wood its strength, okay? It's the ties that, and it's basically aromatic rings, so long chain aromatic ring chemicals that bind these cellulose chains together. Now, if you're going to turn around and try to make pulp, what you have to do is separate or break that bond between the lignin and the cellulose, all right? And so that was the challenge. Now, there's a couple ways you can do this process, right? Um, so if you, if you think about it, what you could do is you could try to mechanically pulp it. So it means that you could come in with a, a grinding stone and you could take your wood chips and you could grind them up. And in doing so, what you're going to do is break all those lignin molecules up and you're going to separate the cellulose apart. Now, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is chemically, going in and chemically chain and cut those chains of the lignin and try to extract the, the lignin out of the cellulose, all right? So let's talk about mechanical pulping. And mechanical pulping, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take wood chips and you're gonna soak them in water, very hot water, and then you're gonna put them between grinding stones and they could be steel discs or they could be stones, and you're gonna try to break those lignin bonds. And, the, and what is gonna happen is, is the, you're gonna wind up with shorter chains of the cellulose, because you're also gonna break up some of the cellulose, right? And the lignin is gonna be left behind. You haven't taken the lignin out, it's still there. So the advantage of doing it this way, right, mechanical pulping is, is that you get a much higher yield. If I, if I start with 100 pounds of wood, I get nearly 100 pounds of pulp at the end because I haven't taken anything away, right? But the lignin tends to yellow with time. Right? So even though the paper that you're making is cheaper, it tends to have less strength to it and it will degrade much more rapidly. And so that paper that is mechanically pulped is what we use for newspaper because newspaper typically yellows and you want something inexpensive, all right? Now in chemical pulping, the crowd process, what you're gonna do is you're gonna grind up your, your wood and then you're gonna expose it to sodium hydroxide and sol sodium sulfide. And those sodium sulfide uh, will go in and help to break the chemical bonds between the cellulose and the lignin, all right? And that reaction process actually produces a lot of heat that's actually used to power generators. Now, once you've dissolved all this lignin in this liquor, you'll wash it away. We call it a black liquor, all right? And that then yields basically pure cellulose left behind. But the yield is far less because I've removed that 30% to 40% of the weight of the wood that was all lignin. 
and you've taken that away. So your yields are lower, but the quality of the cellulose is much higher. All right, and so that is used typically in making paper like this. So it's very strong material and it can be very white because it doesn't have that uh, lignin in it anymore. And so now the challenge with this process is it uses lots of water and it can pollute a lot. So if you've ever walked by a pulp making factory and you smell that smell, that's the sulfides coming off of the chemicals that are used to break the lignin out. All right. So there are a number of videos out there that show you how you can make pulp, which is the starting process, right, where you're taking the wood and separating the, the cellulose from the lignin, and then how you make paper, which is how you take the pulp then and you dissolve that in water and then you can create this composite. And so, and the way you make this composite is to lay those fibers down as cellulose and then to press them between hot rollers until you dry it and then the product becomes very stable. Now, one of the tricks when you'll find out when you watch these videos is, is that when you start with cellulose, it doesn't naturally want to stick together. And so what they have to do is go in and chemically treat the surface of the cellulose molecule so that it basically becomes somewhat hairy, if you will. And those hairs then help to stick the fibers together and that's what gives paper its strength. All right, so we have of course evolved more recently into other means of storing information. So we have moved from what you might call a paper era into a digital era. And 2002 was the first year where we actually stored more information as a species digitally than we did on paper. All right, so that was the start or that was the transition point. And by 2007, 97% of all the information was stored digitally. Right? Uh, at that point, it was only 300 exabytes of data. Now it's much larger because it doubles every three years. All right? Now, how do you store that information digitally? Right? Well, when we first started, we were storing information in all sorts of different forms. By the 80s, we had developed floppy disks. This is basically a magnetic drive. And what happened is, is that I would store information by storing the direction at which the magnetic domain on this, on this piece of magnetically coated material was pointed. If it's pointed one way, it'd be a one. If it's pointed the other way, it's a zero. And then I would use a, a head to read the information on this magnetic storage media. Now, that was a great way of storing smaller quantities of information. And what you find with digital information is, is that it evolves very fast, right? We went from a floppy disk, which is, of course, no longer readable, to zip disks, which stored even more information, right? And then all the way to today, where we have these magnetic hard drives. Now, a magnetic hard drive can store terabytes of information, which is tremendous, right, compared to something like this, which was storing only a, a few megabytes of information. Um, and again, the, the, the technology behind the hard drive is not that much different from the technology that was used in a floppy drive. It's just that the density of the magnetic storage process has increased enormously. And so because of that, I can store a whole lot more information. In fact, we've gone from storing information that was stored laterally, parallel to the surface, to being stored vertically, because we can pack them in even tighter now, right? So you have a perpendicular uh, alignment of your information that you're trying to store. And so, as I said, since its introduction, the, the capacity has increased from something like 3.75 megabytes in 1955, when they developed the first hard drive, to, to well over four terabytes now, and, uh, and larger, right? Uh, it's a million-fold increase since 1955. Um, the physical volume has increased, just decreased by 100,000 in terms of the amount of, uh, of volume that I have to have to store the information that I want to store. The weight has decreased by 20,000. The price has decreased by 250 million times, right? So, so this has been a phenomenal growth, probably rivaling only the, uh, it's the only method that's, that rivals uh, what we'll see when we talk about Moore's Law and semiconductor calculating uh, materials. So you've seen how this thing has evolved. What's the future? Well, obviously one of the challenges anytime you start transitioning these, these processes is how do I keep up with the technology? For example, like I said, I can no longer read this information because I don't have the technology to do that, right? However, a piece of paper written 2,000 years ago, I can still read on. So 
So there's always been this interesting question of as we evolve and we need more and more storage uh, uh, capability, right? And this is being driven today in large part by video. So everybody out there taking cell phone videos is storing lots of stuff on the cloud. Well, the cloud is, is huge collections of information storage devices like this hard drive, right? And so as you try to create more and more information, we need a place to store it. But curiously enough, paper is still around. Right? And so it's interesting to think about what, why that is the case, right? This ability to translate and transcend technology is one of the things that makes paper still attractive. So in the future, don't expect one technology to displace the other one entirely. I would expect that certain technologies will continue to exist simply because they work no matter what technology comes along.